G'day folks, it's Michael from Doom and Darkness bringing you the long-awaited Hammers of Sigma. That's right folks, I know most of you thought that I was going to stop doing this series and I certainly was, but just time got ahead of me. But I'm going to bang this out and we're going to continue my friends. So if you don't know what this is, then listen closely. There are no visuals with this. It's very much like a podcast or something similar. And I'm going to review slash rehash the books in the uh, the Realm Gate Wars. Now, um, my memory is terrible, and I read these a long, long time ago, so I'm just going to narrate shit. It's not going to be verbatim. I'm just going to spew forth my memory onto this YouTube presentation and hopefully provide you with some entertainment to paint your miniatures too and hopefully catch up with the fluff. Now, I highly recommend that you all go out and buy these books. Listening to these is in no way a substitution for any factual representation of what actually happened in the story. I probably didn't even get it right when I read it, let alone six months later while I'm just trying to go off memory. Um, this particular book was my most hated book in the whole series, I have to say, and hate is a too strong a word for me to use because I didn't hate it but uh, I certainly disliked it compared to a lot of the others, and I'll sort of explain why as we go. So if you're not up to date with the Age of Sigma fluff, you can listen to these and get a rough idea of what's happened and, and how things have progressed and where things are at as they are. Um, if you are up to date with the, uh, the fluff and you just want to call me out on every single little niggly thing that I get wrong, and I warn you there will be a lot, you can kindly... Um, piss off. <laughs> no, you can't. Leave your comments below. Let me know where I'm wrong because wherever I get wrong, you know, someone out there will want to know the truth so they can just read your comments and they will be factually enlightened. So I do thank you very much for that. Um, I'm even going to read a little bit to you. Now, this is shocking because my reading skills are probably back at like a year four or five. That's like primary school level. But um, we'll see how we go. So I'm just going to kick off, read a little bit of this to you, and then I'll go talk about the story and uh, my thoughts on it. So let's kick the tires, light the fires, the hammer falls. Vengeance tears from my throat, ring through the bloodless metal of my mask. God King, I cry in a voice that is no longer my own. God King, how my lightning-born brothers as the tempest hurls us from the sky. The ground gives as we land, but Zarax rides on. It ignoring the odd yielding terrain. I cling to her scales, as blind as a newborn. The others are close behind, and I hear their metal boots pounding across this broken, benighted land. Weapons are drawn, oaths are howled, and I take my first breath of mortal air. Sulfur pours through my mouthpiece, and I gulp it down, relishing the bitterness. The storm thins, revealing plumes of smoke and embers. I whisper to Zarax, and as she slows, I sense others gathering around me. I almost pity those we have come to destroy. Who could dream of such an enemy? The smoke drifts, revealing glimpses of a tortured landscape. We're heading down a glistening, crimson road that seems to have been carved from a flayed corpse. Sigmar's tempest has landed us on a butcher's block of body parts and thrashing broken wings. It's a shameful sight, but I don't avert my gaze. I must be vigilant, aware. I must understand this place quickly. I look hard and realise that it's not a road, but a bridge of meat and chains, hazy with flies. Its span is vast beyond measure, stretching miles ahead before disappearing into a crimson wall of smoke. Over the side I glimpse wisps of cloud and realise we're far above the ground. Shrieks fill the air and I see that the bridge is alive. The whole structure is made of living birds, thousands of them broken and burned together by hot irons and fixed to a mesh of thick oily chains. It's the stink of their ruined flesh that fills my lungs. It's their thrashing bodies I'm riding across and their pain I can hear. I want to roar in outrage, but I bite down my fury and keep my voice level. Advance, I say, rising up in my saddle and turning to face my army. My heart races as I see what I command. The storm has spawned a golden host. Even in this stinking bloody wound, they are a vision. Every one of them is clad entirely in gleaming armour, still crackling with the fury of the storm. Penance trail above glinting, hallowed helmets, bearing the divine signals of Sigma and the Celestial City. No army ever looked so glorious, so dignified, and Sigma has entrusted it to me. The vanguard is a seamless wall of shield-bearing liberators, numberless ranks of heroes marching towards me in perfect unison. Then come the routines of paladins, 
striding goliaths that dwarf even liberators clad in blessed gold wrought suits of armor some carry great two-handed hammers that look like they could topple city walls while other wield pole arms long gleaming glaives with lightning in their blades in the rear guard are my divine archers hundreds of judicators moving with the same precision as the rest of the army reading their shimmering bows high above riding in the thunderheads are our wing guardians the prosecutors blah 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 just talks a little bit more shit about how fucking glorious the stormcasts are um i turn back to the bridge and see the sky for the first time it's almost entirely obscured by rock a vast sphere of smoldering ore hundreds of miles in diameter hangs directly over our heads such a star burnt hulk can only be a moon dragged from the heavens by divine will it's moving toward us shedding sparks and boulders as it glides majestically through the clouds the sky ripples in its wake like water in the lee of a ship. Lord Celestin, I look down from Zarex's back at Lord Relic de Boris. I can barely recognise my brother's dry tones. His arcane duties have left their mark on, my, on his speech, just like every other part of him. As I was being drilled and remained in the celestial city, Sigmar sent my brother through death and beyond. Eternity echoes in his every word. Unlike the rest of us, my brother's mask resembles a bleached skull, and I find myself wondering what lies behind. Would I recognise his face? Unlike me, he has endured Sigma's fire a second time. He knows what it really means to be immortal. Now, that's all I'm going to read to you, folks, because this is my impression of the book. So basically what happens is um, a storm host is teleported into this unknown fucking land, and they find themselves on the Bridge of Birds. And as confusing and, and as foreign as um, that, scene, that scene may have been to you, you know, they're just on this fucking never-ending bridge of birds suspended in the middle of nowhere with a fucking moon heading towards them. That is as foreign and weird as this whole book has to me. Now, they're, they're in a place, I think it's called the, the Carvel Steeps or something like that. And in this whole book, I don't know where this book is set. Like... I don't know what realm it's in. I, I just don't know what's going on. And every different scene that they come across is something that's equally bizarre and equally just confounding as the situation they first find themselves in. And um, throughout the entire book, as I was reading it, my mind was constantly struggling with the realm that they were fighting in and this this was a real big drawback for me um in the book so if you're out there and you've read this book in more detail or you you just know stuff um right below like what realm are they in and why is this place so fucking weird but anyways old mate lord celestin gets teleported down with his storm host and he finds himself on this bridge of spears spears this bridge of birds and he's like fuck this is not where we're meant to be but nevertheless we're stormcast let's go sally forth charge and attack lo and behold out of nowhere comes the most boring fucking enemy you can imagine which is a whole ton of blood reavers right so they're fighting blood reavers and it's a tra traditional shit where the blood reavers are smashing against loretta shields and blah 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 meanwhile there's this fucking moon that is heading towards them right so you got to imagine this like bridge in infinity that's the end of it's obscured by smoke and just this fucking moon coming down towards them and as the moon gets closer the gravity of the moon is starting to pull them all up right so like storm cars are being like sucked into the sky and and being shuffled off and and you know all this kind of stuff and that's when they realize finally after like fighting these blood reavers for fucking ever they finally realize that all of these blood reavers are chained to the bridge I find it hard to believe that they didn't notice that, you know, by the time they'd killed half of them, it was only when the moon was like right close that this became a problem. Um, and all my sort of basic university physics were sort of screaming at me as this moon is coming down. And I think from memory, the moon sort of comes down and dips under the bridge and then goes back up. Um, I don't know, but it was fucking weird. So that's where it sort of starts. And they force their way through and they, they've sort of worked out that they're not where they're meant to be, right? They were meant to be teleported at a certain place, which was the um, Crucible of Blood, I think, or the, the yeah, it's the Crucible of Blood, it's called. And the Crucible of Blood is 
a giant freaking cauldron of blood, which is also a realm gate. And it's the realm gate to the realm of corn, right? And it's from here that demons and bloodletters and shit are just sent like everywhere into all the different realms and whatever else. So the goal was is to teleport this storm host right down, right on top of the realm gate and conquer it or destroy it or do whatever it is that they want to do. But it's turned out that they found themselves on this bridge and that's not right. And the truth is they've actually been diverted by a certain sorceress who lives in this land who is seeking revenge against the corn owners that have, have now inhabit it. And so they, she thought it would be best if she diverts them and, you know, serves her purposes as well. So the storm hosts go through, they fight their way through this bridge and, and kill these blood reavers. And they go through this, this series of just, it just seems like insane fucking landscapes. But, um, they sort of know where the crucible of blood is and they need to make a beeline for it. But in between them and the crucible is this anvil, right? I think it's called the anvil and it's a, a, a fortress of corn bigger than you can imagine. So they talk that the size of this thing is so big that it creates its own weather. You know, that if you built this thing for a million years, you couldn't build something as big, maybe not a million years. But you know, the, the scale and immensity, like this, the anvil, this fortress, this corn fortress is larger than any fortress or any, like it's as big as a mountain, a whole mountain sort of thing. This is the size and the vastness of this, of this, um, this corn fortress. Now, before they get to the corn fortress, they go through, I think it's the sea of, uh, not the sea of bones, but it's, uh, maybe it's the garden of bones or it's something similar to that. And there is a, it's basically a field, field of bones, perhaps, as far as the eye can see of hands, skeletal hands, just reaching out of the ground and they're holding like swords and they're just waving, just gently waving, right? And so just imagine a billion million different skeletal hands all sticking out of the ground, all holding something and just waving in the breeze like grass or like a plant. And what they say is that this, uh, and they actually say this as well, which kind of pissed me off, is that this sea of bones or whatever it is, is the remnants of the greatest army ever to be raised. They even say that. They don't just say of this world or of this realm or of this whatever. They say this was the greatest army ever raised and it was absolutely crushed by corn dominions. And they just walk through and walloped everyone and now there's like, you know, this thing is the the curse, the legacy of um, of whatever. And I just kind of thought, if this was the greatest army, it obviously wasn't because it's been smashed. Like, you know, you sort of... Anyways, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in the background and, and all you need to know is really is that half of the corn forces that are in the anvil um, are lured away to a different spot. Well, maybe not half, but half anyway, so they, they piss off. And the blood's a crater and, uh, and an enormous corn hoarder are what, what remains. So they've conquered the, the bridge of birds. They've gone through the, the fucking um, fields of, of bony hands and they get to the anvil and they're just like, what are we going to do? And they're like, well, listen, we've only got a limited amount of time. They have to get to the crucible of blood before nighttime. I won't tell you why. I'll tell you what happens later when night times come, but they're in a rush and they're just like, well, we're stormcast. That's a corn fortress. We're pretty boring. The only thing for us to do is charge basically like, let's just take it head on. And, um, and that's what they do. They just fucking charge in there and they just start smashing everything. And, you know, there are sort of scenes, I think it describes when they get into the courtyard and they see the corn forces that are arrayed before them. It's like a press of bodies back to back that goes to the horizon, you know, to give you an idea of the, the scale of this horde that's inside the anvil. And also, you know, sort of goes with the size of the anvil as well. Like this is just a, an insane amount of of corn. It's fucking blood for the blood god. And um, they're in there and they're fighting away and uh, you know, they're smashing corn and corn's got skull crushes and whatever else. And it's been led by this blood to crater who's actually got no skin. Like all his skin has been flayed. So he's just like this ridiculously flying, uh, sorry, smiling um, 
<laughs> like red seeping muscle sort of dude. And uh, anyways, it's at this point where um, the Lord Relictor, he sort of realizes, oh, fuck, you know, this isn't really going to work out for us. We've got to do something about it. So he pisses off back to the realm of death because that's where he came from. He's got some mates there. I think he used to be a necromancer or something like that in his previous life before he was reincarnated as Lord Relictor. And he goes and finds his own, his old master who's like hidden in this uh, realm within a realm within the realm of death, you know, where, where the, uh, the chaos forces can't get him. And he goes and sees this guy and they have a little bit of to and froing and uh, talk about what they've become and whatever else. And this necromancer agrees to help him. And he says, and it's sort of like, it's just very glib, like it's very fast. And the necromancer basically says, yep, no worries. I'll help you, you know, take these corn guys out and don't think anything of it. It's already done. Like it was just a whim for this great necromancer to, to do the feat that he's about to do. And um, it's, it's already done. You know what I mean? Now, it turns out that the anvil, this fortress that's as big as a mountain that makes its own weather, they built on top of the fossils of a god beast, right? So this is, uh, there's a skeleton of a creature as big as a world that this thing has been built on. This is the sort of scale that it's sort of like that everything has to be. And this necromancer in the realm of death, on a whim, animates, brings it back to life. So this giant fucking skeleton just basically stands up, right? It's like a big lizard thing, maybe a dragon or something like that. It just stands up and the anvil that was built on its back is just absolutely smashed, like rises up in the air, crashed into a million pieces, thrown everywhere and whatever else. Every corn fucker that was in there is dead and just killed instantaneously. And then the skeleton just starts running across the world towards the crucible of blood. All the stormcasts are like, fuck yeah, follow that guy. So they follow the, the big giant sort of skeleton. Now, remember I said half the force, the corn force ran off and the other half stayed behind in the anvil and got poleaxed at a whim by a giant reanimated god beast? Well, the other half basically were on their way to the crucible of blood. And uh, to get to the crucible of blood, they have to f cross a giant lake of lava, right? That's the only way I can sort of describe this. There, there's a lot more to it, but it's, it's a giant lake of lava. And that army got across on these uh, giant floating rocks, which are pulled by gorgons. They seem to be flame resistant gorgons. And like I said, guys, I read this book six months ago. So if I'm getting the details wrong, then I, I do apologize, but these are fucking gorgons that are walking through lava and they're sort of chained to these rocks and they're pulling them or they're pulling the chains, which are pulling the rocks either way. And the, the, um, the chaos guys with the chaos lord and stuff, you know, they're getting attacked by like chimeras and stuff and whatever else, but, um, but that's fine. So they make it across to where the crucible of blood is. This giant fucking god beast skeleton just basically crashes into the lava lake and the, the magic that's sort of animating is failing and he's melting a bit. And he just basically lies down and his bones of his vertebrae make a giant bone bridge across the lava. So now the Stormcast can cross. And while, of course, the Stormcasts are crossing, they have some epic battles against the Gorgons and stuff like that as well. And, you know, they were just a bit like, there was, it, was, it was a little bit disappointing. That's what I'm going to say. Now, when they get to where the Crucible of Blood is, they finally get there. And the Crucible of Blood is pretty cool because when Korn was trying to conquer this realm, I still don't know where it is, but when he was trying to conquer it, the city, the last city to fall was a city of titans. That's what they call them. They call them titans. They don't call them giants or gargants or anything. They call them titans. And Korn, with all his armies could not defeat the city, right? The city would not fall. The city was invulnerable. And so Korn sent the greatest fucking blood let, uh, bloodthirster that ever fucking existed to conquer this city. And they talk about this guy being as big as the sky. You know what I mean? It's just like this fucking bloodthirster of the most immense and epic rage and size and scale 
you can ever imagine. And even he couldn't submit the city, right? Um, and so with all of Korn's uh, attempts being fucked up, eventually the big man, Korn himself, comes. And I'm going to get this kind of wrong, but he basically gets the fucking crucible. Like it's like a giant fucking skull and just smashes it down and freezes and traps the city in that moment right in that moment of its fall or in that moment of whatever but corn comes down and in putting down the crucible he kind of freezes time and the the titans are forever frozen as basically ghosts you know twilight ghosts or something living in the city from from this point on and that giant bloodthirster is chained to the crucible chained in the crucible right and he is pissed off he's angry because he can't do fuck all so what happens is every time night falls the crucible fills with blood the bloodthirster wakes up he gets all angry because he's stuck in this giant brass skull starts smashing his axe around all the blood and shit that overfills from the crucible and gets knocked around they say every drop of blood that spills becomes a blood letter so the whole area and and then every night all of the giants are basically all killed again because the blood happens the blood comes out it all turns into these enormous hordes of of corn which sort of re-swarm back through the city and that that final battle and final death of the titans is sort of relived by them by the ghosts but also you know you can imagine uh, it splashes a big thick, a lot of blood out of the cauldron and um, that blood as it's falling it may turn into blood letters there but it may just appear or manifest itself as blood letters in one of the other realms and so this is how it's sort of um corn's uh realm gate into the other realms as well because it just spews corn madness everywhere so no wonder these guys want to kill it now the the corn lord and so forth they ended up going to there first because they were manipulated by the sorceress who told them that that's where the storm cars would be finally a worthy enemy they went there first um absolutely deceived they turn around get angry and then realize that well the storm cars have come here anyway so let's do it let's have a fight now by this point that necromancer you know that necromancer who you know at a whim just reanimated this giant fucking monster well he's realized that um he doesn't want the storm cars to have this realm gate he doesn't want to have corn to have it anymore either and he's kind of like well we need to kind of step in and do something because we've just been sitting our ass for so long so him and he teams up with a vampire they get their two armies and they just fucking push in as well on the crucible and all of a sudden it's like enormous armies of undead a small army of, of storm cast all the corn and then night happens the bloodthirster pops up there are blood letters everywhere and it's just it was really disappointing because this necromancer who was so fucking powerful is now getting slaughtered by blood letters um so i'm sort of thinking to myself well hang on in one second you can raise this giant skeleton at a whim but now your skeleton's just getting slaughtered by blood letters and you're struggling to beat them off your coven throne i think he's on a coven throne um so it's kind of disjointed that way um nevertheless you know i won't tell you the the, the ultimate details but um the the well the good guys are victorious i should say and the realm gate is shut down now it was kind of uh, what, what what ended up happening i will tell you some details I, I do lie is that the crucible was essentially linked to the bloodthirster and his chain to the crucible was binding him into existence into this world and all this kind of stuff so all he really had to do was go sever that chain to the bloodthirster who was thrashing around inside the crucible spilling the blood ringing the bell and um and you could shut the whole thing down but um that's basically the moral of this story and i just wanted to bang this one out quickly guys and and get it done because I really want to get to the other books that are really, really good. And I didn't enjoy this one that much. It just seemed disjointed. There was stuff in there that, that didn't make sense. Like I said, in one moment, this necromancer is all powerful. At a whim, I can do destroy the entire anvil. The next minute, he's like, oh, these blood letters are like killing my skeletons. I'm powerless to stop them. And it's like, what the fuck? Um, the, I don't even know what the storm host was. Like, it just seemed like, what it seemed like is someone wrote this book and they published it and it didn't 
like a standalone, like a separate. So you have the Realm Gate Wars with all the, the Realm of Life and the Realm of Metal and all this sort of stuff where you've got this sort of progressive story that's happening and it's a continuation of things. And then when I got to this book, I felt like this was just something that was completely separate, standalone, almost had no relevance to anything else, had no bearing on anything else. Nothing else from my memory from this book is pulled into any of the others. And it just kind of didn't make sense. The, the realm it was in was just this far out, extravagant, weird sort of thing. And um, yeah, I, I just didn't like it. So I know some people really did like it though. Um, oh, hang on. Ha. Huh. Yeah, and, and so that, that's the first half of this book, I should say. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of something here at the moment to try and, like, I don't know, bring something back to add value to anything like that. But there's nothing really... Yeah, there's just nothing really in it. Um, now, the second part of the story is about Galmaraz, and it's kind of the first appearance of Galmaraz, and, you know, the Celestine Prime, and I'll make a second video about that, because, yeah, that story is shit as well, um, like, honestly, this whole book was just garbage, but it's a new story in itself, so I'll sort of sign off on this one, and then I'll take you to that, and then after we've finished off on this book, we can go ahead and get into the good stuff, which is the Call of Archeon, um, which is the first time we look at Chaos. Some people didn't like it. I absolutely loved it, so I can't wait to talk about it. But that's it, folks. Um, I will keep making these. I, I've just been dreading reviewing this book. That's been the big reason why, I think. So um, if you haven't watched the other ones, go back and watch the other ones, listen to this one, and I'll get the next one out soon. That's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Ciao, grazie.